Hello and welcome to Premier League All Access with me, Sam Matterface. Alongside me, as always, is TalkSport's Chief Football Correspondent, Alex Krug. And we're joined today by the former Wimbledon, Tottenham, Manchester United forward, Terry Gibson, who joins us to look at what has been an exciting first half of the season in the Premier League. Here's what's to come. West Ham at home, I think is a game, despite the fact West Ham are in terrific form that if you're going to have serious title aspirations you have to win and it's that lack of a number nine that lack of killer instinct they've scored fewer goals than all of their title rivals and if they don't spend in January that may come back and haunt them. I'll begin to look at Arsenal in the Champions League this year and think they're genuine contenders I still don't think so. And for me Nicholas Jackson was going to go to Bournemouth the previous transfer window and he's the type of player who should be at a club like Bournemouth learning his trade in the Premier League not leading the line for Chelsea. So I do feel for Hoyland, if you're a centre forward and your job is to score goals and your teammates are not passing to you, because you're young, because you, he might be polite, he's a little bit, little bit shy maybe, and he's looking around and just hoping it's going to change. But 21 goals, 19 games, but that's why I don't think they'll finish top four. But a brilliant first half of the season, but if you're asking me to Aston Villa finish in the Champions League places, I'm going to say no. Well, we've all agreed that uh, we've got a title race. You two think that Manchester City are going to come back and win it. That probably will happen because we've seen that over the course of the last few seasons. They're the best team in the world. We know they've got the propensity to put a run together. But if anyone can hold them off, who is it? Gentlemen, hello. Greetings of the season to you, Terry, and to you, Crook. Um, it's been uh, a week since we last convened for the uh, Premier League All Access uh, podcast, and a lot has happened. Arsenal have played twice, and they've dropped points twice. What's happened to Arsenal? Well, I don't think you can really criticise them too much for the point at Anfield. Uh, not many teams go there and win. But yeah, West Ham at home, I think, is a game, despite the fact West Ham are in terrific form, that if you're going to have serious title aspirations, you have to win. And I think you asked Mikel Arteta about it after the game. It's that lack of a number nine, that lack of killer instinct. They've scored fewer goals than all of their title rivals. And if they don't spend in January... That may come back and haunt them. OK, so you're going to concede now that I was right about Liverpool being the uh, the best of the, the rest to try and challenge Man City for the title. Because you kept telling me that Arsenal have got more goal threats and then they drew a blank. I never said that. I, I, said that <laughs> I said that Arsenal, for me, were a, a more a more balanced team. Yeah. Um, and I probably maintain that because I still think Liverpool are a work in progress. You changed I think, your mind yet? I think the big winners from this week are Manchester City. They've gone away. They've had a, a nice relaxing break in Saudi Arabia. They've played a couple of pub teams. They've been crowned the best team in the world. And they've come back and cut the gap at the top. On Wednesday, was telling me that Arsenal are going to win the league. By Friday, we're nothing but Man City are probably going to come back and win it. He flip-flops quite often. What about you, Terry? There's what? been a realisation, I think, in the last week or so, with, that, with City not playing the game as well and, and the other teams dropping points, that maybe City have been rolled up enough by the fact that they haven't had a great start to the season. And perhaps a team that's won all those trophies in 12 months needs a little bit of motivation. It probably took them a little while to get going. And there were a lot of people suggesting it was time for someone else to win the league. But for me, it is, uh, City are, are going to win it again. Okay. I think they've got the best players, the best manager. They've got the winning mentality. I think Liverpool out of the rest, are um, Arsenal are out of the rest. I think are slightly ahead of Liverpool in terms of the signings are not new in terms of Liverpool's new midfield that they're building. But I'm surprised how well Liverpool are doing. So it's I think the best of the rest is is clearly what we're looking at in the Premier League now compared to Manchester City. Uh, elsewhere this week, Brighton beat Tottenham Hotspur, uh, exposing that high line of Ange Postacoglu, but also exposing the fact that their first choice centre-backs weren't available. Chelsea beat Crystal Palace, don't know how, but they did it in the end. Uh, they're a little bit off the cuff. They're a little bit, oh, they're a little bit frustrating at times, Chelsea, but a Noni Madueke penalty sealed all three points at Stamford, which is three home games in a row, actually, that they've won now for Maurizio Pochettino, who does seem to be still pulling his hair out. Um, and uh, also uh, some good performances uh, further down the, uh, the down the league table as well. I thought on uh, Tuesday in particular, great performance from Nottingham Forest on Boxing Day away at Newcastle. Uh, Bournemouth going great guns as well. And that Sheffield United-Luton game was particularly impressive, wasn't it? 3-2. Uh, to Luton in the end, coming back from 2-1 down with 13 minutes to go. They've got a big weekend this weekend. They take on uh, Chelsea. We're going to focus really on what's happened so far over the, the early part of the season, have a little bit of a look at what could happen in the future as we look at the midway point of the Premier League season. Who maybe will end up getting into the top four? Will there be a top five? And who's going to win the title? So let's get stuck into our mid-season review.
Well, we've all agreed that uh, we've got a title race. You two think that Manchester City are going to come back and win it. That probably will happen <laughs> because we've seen that over the course of the last few seasons. They're the best team in the world. We know they've got the propensity to put a run together. But if anyone can hold them off, who is it? Arsenal, for me, still, despite the fact they've had a bad week. I think Liverpool losing Mo Salah for a period of time to the African Cup of Nations, maybe including a trip to the Emirates, I think is a big blow for them. And I do think Arsenal will bounce back, but I do think they might have to spend a few quid in January to do it. Is it fair to say that none of the contenders are actually playing particularly at the top of their game? They're not at their absolute max. I mean, Arsenal dropped points, Liverpool are playing well, they're putting points on the ball, but they're not at the, the levels yeah, we've seen late before. Goals, isn't there? A lot of late goals, isn't yeah. Even like Manchester that. City dropping, yeah. uh, going, from, going behind against Everton, then having to come back, that's been a feature of their season as well. Yeah, I think it, no one's hit top speed, I don't think. Now, is it that they, they can't be warming up at this stage of the season? And I just wonder whether there is anyone out there that, that's in the position that they should be in terms of money spent by the clubs. When I mean, you look at the money spent by Premier League football clubs, I mean, you, you talked about Bournemouth. They spent £100 million last year. They mm. should be good. All the clubs spend that type of money. They should all perhaps are guilty of being as, not as good as, as they should be. Hence the reason why I still put City as favourites. So Liverpool had a lot of construction work to do in terms of midfield, moving players on. They've done that. The younger midfield, the young players that they've bought in the past are coming good now. That, you know, and and that, that makes a difference. Arsenal are further down the line, but I'm still not convinced that Arsenal are... Are we going to look at Arsenal in the Champions League this year and think they're genuine contenders? I still don't think so. So, you know, Manchester United, Chelsea, Tottenham have been hit and miss because of their issues that they've got with a good, solid, a really good start eleven, but then perhaps the strength in depth isn't there, which is understandable when Postacoglu it's his first season. So I think there's a lot of teams not doing as well as they should be when you consider the money you spend. And the best run clubs, maybe there's some clubs that are, we're not talking about at the moment, but... but Punch above their weight because of Bournemouth, Brighton, teams like that. Even West Ham, really. Even West Ham. But even the, the teams that we expect to be challenging City, I still think there's a lot of work to be done. Interesting, isn't it? Because if you look through all the squads, everybody's got huge amounts of injuries. It feels like at least yeah. one part of the season has been disrupted for every club with you know double-figure injuries that have affected their team selection. I imagine that we're all going to blame it on the fact that there was a World Cup last year and that sort of the amount of football that has increased as a result of that and the proximity to the season has just been too testing. Is there any other reasons why we think that might be the case? Well, I think it's also the demands that managers put on their players now. We, we've spoken a lot about Ange Postacoglu and the way that his team uh, likes to play. They picked up a lot of muscular type injuries and you wonder if there's a coincidence there. Eddie Howe's him saying? Exactly, just the sheer work rate that managers demand. Aston Villa have not suffered too badly, have they, from injuries? You take Tyrone Mings out of the equation mm. uh, and maybe it'll be interesting to see if they did pick up a couple of knocks, if they could sustain what they've done in the first half of the season. But that's what I think also gives Man City the edge because they, they managed to come back from behind and a, a pretty impressive second half performance against Everton the other night without Haaland, without De Bruyne, who's basically had the first half of the season off, without Doku, without Ruben Diaz. You put them four back in the team, if they're fully fit, they're going to be like new signings, certainly the case of De Bruyne. Yeah, Kevin De Bruyne comes back. He's going to be absolutely crucial, isn't he? I mean, he could, yeah. he could inspire them to this huge run and end up winning Player of the Year, probably top the assist charts. And he's only, you know, he's, he's, he's starting from a standing start. Yeah, and they did let players go. I mean, Gundogan left, Riyad Mahrez left. So there was a question about... They struggled to replace those, haven't they, really? Doku's come in as, as one he's of those. Done well, he's done well. He's done well. in that midfield good. area, it hasn't been the same yeah. sort of craft. And I think you know, so De Bruyne solves that problem mm. um, so I think City will get stronger as we go on but it, it, it's the injuries I have a theory about the pitches as well when you you guys have been on the pitches compared mm. to the past I mean it, it, they're bone hard mm. and they train on that pitch those type of surfaces day in day out they water them to make them slick but there's no give in the pitch as well they look great I'm not I'm not convinced that the current day football pitches cater towards top end players that, that maybe particularly the ACL, in, ACL injuries mm. we're getting a lot of those now yeah and men's so we're a long way from the turf that I played on you know. where it was a nice pitch for about a month and then it deteriorated <laughs> and then it was just a mud bath and then by the end of the season it was rock hard 
I feel it has to be a middle ground somewhere where it looks great and plays great. Do, do you think there's also an argument to suggest that maybe the VAR interventions also yeah. cause these problems because they cause delays where players who are constantly usually moving throughout a 90 minute football match actually end up stopping and starting a lot more often. And the game that was very fluid has become a little bit more in nowhere Over 100 near. minutes as well. A lot longer and there's a lot more interruptions. Yeah, I think that, that, that does play a part, particularly in the winter months. Mm. The last thing you want when you're playing and it's December, January, February, you're hanging around waiting for a refereeing decision and it takes three, four, five minutes in, in some cases. So yeah, no, I think that is, that is a part of it. But it's, it's, it's devastating when you look at, look at Spurs last night, there are two centre-backs missing, two centre-midfield missing, and Madison, and I presume we were suspended, but it, it's, you know, that's five first-team players transformed that 11 last night. And interesting that you talk about those players that are missing because Tottenham are one of the clubs that are going to be heavily impacted by the AFCON and the Asian Cup, which is going to take place between the middle of January and in the middle of, of February. And, and we've gone through the Tottenham squad in particular. They're going to lose, well, they've got Van de Ven and Romero out with injury. And Madison. They've got Madison out with injury. Son's going to the Asia Cup. papsar has been called up by Senegal. Basuma is going to be called up by Mark. So that's going to be six first team players yeah. with the spine of the team. It's massive for Tottenham. And I think that's why Ange Postacoglu is already making noises about the January transfer window. Wants to get players in well before the deadline because I think he looks at January. They've obviously got an FA Cup game, which I think they need to win, really, after what happened in the League Cup and him naming a weak inside and going out of that competition. They go to Manchester United. He's going to want to be as strong as possible for that game. So I think it is important for Spurs to get players in the building. Yeah, and they, they're not the only ones impacted because uh, Manchester United are going to lose their goalkeeper. Yep. That's going to happen and they're going to have to start... Um, they might get one who actually saved the ball. D. He just made a massive <laughs> save against Aston Villa the other night. Brilliant save to keep you in the game. You ended up coming back and winning that. What are you being so grumpy about him for? <laughs> he did chuck the first one in. <laughs> <laughs> and the one in at West Ham the weekend before Apart that. from that, he's been brilliant. Um, <laughs> but there was a few clubs that are going to suffer a little bit from that. Nicholas Jackson is going away uh, for uh, Chelsea, so they're not going to have him uh, for a couple of weeks too. Those advertising hoardings would be safe for a Stanford I was going to say that. Uh, was that a leading question that maybe that it was leading towards perhaps that they'd be better off without him? Uh, he's a weird player, Nicholas Jackson. He's had a weird little career. Yeah, but he's still young, right? He's 22. Exactly. He, he had a good two months at VRL. <laughs> and, and that's and what Chelsea, been an Chelsea outstanding. I mean, you could see attributes there. He, he'd only scored one goal and then he scored nine, I think, in a, in a couple of months and took Villarreal from mid-table to the European Europa League spot. And he made an, a, a, an impact. And, then, and clubs did ask me in, the, in this country, what do you think of Nicholas Jackson? I said, I don't know. He's had four or five, six maybe, outstanding games where he's hit top form. His we agent's had, done very well. We hadn't him. seen it before. He wasn't a regular. He was playing here, playing there, coming off the bench and stuff like that. He thought, well, he looks quick, he looks sharp, he looks strong, he looks lively. Um, and then out of the blue, he had this run a fall and, and clubs were desperate to get him. What did Chelsea pay? About 30 for him, wasn't there? No, it was a little bit more than that, wasn't it? it? Was, I think it was about 30 million, which is a lot of money by La Liga standards. Yeah. No one else in La Liga was going to pay it. And, it, and it, it's, it's a tough introduction to elite football now because he was not a first-team regular at VRL. So to jump from VRL where you had an impact at the end of the season for 10 games to Chelsea and being expected to score 20 goals and follow in the footsteps of Drogba and Torres. It's and either a genius people. move and they've got someone right at yeah. the beginning of their career who's going to develop into a supreme talent and they've spotted the attributes and they feel as if they can coach him going forward and make him blossom into a terrific striker. Or it's a major gaffe, isn't it, amongst the number of signings that look like they've fallen flat. Because as, as much as Chelsea have spent, you can't sit here today and say, really, that there's any one particular player out of all of that money, and there's a billion pounds that has been spent, some of them for over 100 million, and go, oh, but he's been fantastic, he's been worth it. The only one, I would say, is Cole Palmer. And he was playing yeah, in the Premier League anyway, and everybody knew yeah. how great he was. That, that, that was a fairly, fairly risk-free signing, but you're right, I think the jury's still out on, on Enzo Fernandez, certainly for the money they paid. I don't think Moises Caicedo is as good a player at this moment in time as he was at Brighton. Maybe that's just adapting to to new surroundings. We, we've spoken about Baddy Ashil. You're not a massive fan. De Sassi, for me, is not Chelsea calibre either. We haven't seen enough of Nkunku yet, although I think he probably will come good. And for me, Nicholas Jackson 
was going to go to Bournemouth, the previous transfer window, and he's the type of player who should be at a club like Bournemouth learning his trade in the Premier League, not leading the line for Chelsea. Uh, we'll see what happens. I don't even know why we're talking about Chelsea because they're not in the title conversation. <laughs> they're barely in the top half conversation. It's a talking point, though, the first half of the season. We didn't know what to expect from Chelsea. Did yeah. this year. We, we, we don't know what to expect from the second players. half. Nonny Madawaki yeah. told me on yeah. uh, Wednesday night, don't worry, our position now will not be our position at the end of the season. Where do you think they'll finish? No, they might get ninth. <laughs> I'm looking down as well as up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, 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 they're just the as likely I mean, to finish in the top half as they are the bottom half. They've won, yeah, seven games out of 19, so it's it's not free-flowing. You know, we haven't mentioned yet, Aston Villa on a terrific run. Uh, Burnley this weekend, uh, they, they, they've won 15 games in a row at home before they drew with Sheffield United. Their home form is terrific. They, they were undone. I think they ran out of steam a little bit against Manchester United the other night, Boxing Night. Uh, but um, they, they've got the propensity to be able to go on another run, haven't they? Uh, it's an interesting question because I think they ran out of ideas against Sheffield United. And you're right, they certainly looked very bedraggled in that second half at Old Trafford. You, you can always judge a team when they're going through adversity, maybe more than when things are going well. Football's an easy game uh, when your confidence is high and you're winning every week. I think it's much more difficult when you just fall below those standards. They don't have the deepest of squads. They're three points off the top halfway. Yeah, it's, been a brilliant, been, it's been a brilliant first half of the credit, right? It's been a brilliant first half of the season, but if you're asking me do Aston Villa finish in the Champions League places, I'm going to say no. Hmm, interesting. I think it's a place up for grabs in the Champions League spots. OK, well, let's talk uh, about and that. I think because... they are one of them that, that can, genuine contenders. Yeah, I think the title race is uh, probably between three clubs, Manchester City, Arsenal and Liverpool. But the Champions League places seems like a bit of a a battle because there may well end up being two extra places apart from those three to play for. Newcastle, Manchester United are both out of the Champions League, but the other clubs, if they perform well enough, may well help us get a fifth, but it looks unlikely at this stage. So who's going to get in? Yeah, I mean, the coefficient as it stands right now is actually, I don't know if you've seen it, Italy and Germany are just slightly ahead and it's like literally almost a percentage point uh, between them and England who are in third position very much helped out by that final night of Europa League action where Liverpool, West Ham and Brighton all won their groups and Aston Villa did well in their Conference League group as well. So it, because they did that, they got extra points. That meant that we closed the gap a little bit. Uh, Germany, I think, probably will continue their trend. Italy, I'm not too sure about how well they're going to do in the second half of the season, but it depends on what happens in the Europa League as well as the Premier League. But in terms of the chasing pack behind the current top four, who is best placed, do you think, to nick that fourth place? I think Spurs. Really? Yeah. Despite all those absentees in January? Yeah. And I think they, they, they will do work in, in January, transfer window. Mm. And I think that that's because I, I don't see an obvious one. As Alex said there, Villa won't be too confident that they can do a top four finish. I think they're genuine contenders. Then after that, West Ham, will they finish top four? United? I doubt it. Brighton, Newcastle, they're, they're training there, Newcastle, aren't they, from a top four finish? Mm. So I don't think there's that many in, in the fight, to be honest. Um, when you look at it, Tottenham are, are just a point behind Manchester City, uh, although City have a game in hand. West Ham are only four points behind Manchester City, and they've been on a brilliant run, 10 wins from 14 games. Manchester United, are they out of it? I suppose that's the big question at this stage. 31 points from 19. They've lost more games before Christmas than at any other stage since 1930. Can they sneak into the top four? I'm not sure they can sneak into the top four, but I think they could possibly sneak into the top five, which, as you've been saying, could well be enough because they've got players coming back from injury. I think the, the arrival of Sir Jim Ratcliffe might just focus a few minds at Old Trafford, not just in the dressing room, but in the dugout as well. And I think they can only improve because it's been such a poor first half of the season. Yet, as you've mentioned, they're only six points off the top four. So they have found a way to win some games where maybe they don't deserve to and nick some points like they did at Anfield. If Eric Ten Hag can, can get it right, as he did last season, I, I, I would give them a chance. The trouble is you can't trust United to turn up with any kind of consistency. Let's see how they follow up that comeback win against Villa and Nottingham Forest. If they win at the city ground, difficult place to go. New manager in the home dugout then maybe I'll start to believe it. In good 21. Yeah, I mean, the, the goal return is ridiculous. It's... Three of those came, by the way. On but Boston Rashford night. looked a lot yeah. better the other night and Hoyland's now off the mark. And they've mm. got to start passing to whoever's playing up front because those stats that we saw yeah. the other were absolutely ridiculous. 
I mean, the, the, I mean, the whole... The, you've seen it. It's clear and obvious now. You've seen it time and time again in a game where you're thinking, you shot the near post, there's a cross, just cut it back. Yeah. Or it was an early cross and you've taken too many touches and everyone's got back in position. So I do feel for Hoyland. And it, 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 because he's young, he's... If he was Alan Shearer, and Alan Shearer said it, didn't he, on programmes, Alan Shearer would have grabbed someone by the scruff <laughs> of the neck if they weren't passing to him enough. He might have done it in the changing room. Um, but that's how it should be. If you're a centre forward and your job is to score goals and your teammates are not passing to you, because you're young, because you, he might be polite, he's a little bit, little bit shy maybe, and he's looking around and just hoping it's going to change. But 21 goals, 19 games, but that's why I don't think they'll finish top four. In the end, he had to rely on John McGinn giving him an assist. John McGinn yeah. assist, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but good old John McGinn. I think Brighton will get better as well. You know, they've had a lot of injuries this season. That was probably their best performance of the season against Tottenham in midweek. Good enough got... to close the gap from 30 points to, to 37. 36 for the top five. Yeah, again, we'll see whether or not that be enough. But and they and could win the Europa could, League, Brighton. And there's every chance of that. But then Champions again, I suppose League football anyway. Liverpool will, will suggest that they can do that as well, which will, you know, help. I, th I think their priorities will be elsewhere. I think it might. And if be you well. say 37, that's City. They're not. They're not catching City. No. So go above it. So you're, so you're probably looking at Villa. So they're, they're, they're nine line. points back from where you think they'll have to be. The, yeah. That's the. That's a big. Or well, six back from bridge. Six back from fifth. Yeah. I think yeah. that's the. I think that's the battle. I'm not. I'm not sure West Ham, uh, when we get in the second half of the season, they're going to be able to sustain that. So who is it then? Because I think they'll try and so who, challenge who, who for Europe fourth? as well. So if Aston Villa don't get fourth, and Tottenham, West Ham, Manchester United, and Brighton don't get fourth, what are you saying? Newcastle are going to get. No, it? I think Tottenham will get in the top four. I, I think the top four will be City, Arsenal, Liverpool, and Spurs, and then it's all about fifth. What about you? I, I think that. Yeah, I agree with that. I think Spurs. They have to do something in the transfer window, but. They have to move people out as well. So we see Eric Dyer, we see Emerson Royale playing centre back. Dyer was on the bench and doesn't get on, so he's got to be moved on. There'll be some other players that need to be moved on to get the the quality in that they've got replacement centre backs because they're going to play. You look at the Spurs team last night; they had a left back and a right back playing at centre back. Yeah. It's not the first time that's happened as well no. this season. It, so they, they and Eric Dyer was there and a young centre back. I'm not sure we've forgotten his name. Ashley Phillips. Bench. Ashley Phillips on the bench, mm. and yet Postecoglou trusts Ben Davis and Emerson Royal before them. So yeah, and they went four 0 no down. Yeah, could have been seven. <laughs> I was, yeah, it was amazing at the end because well, it could have been seven, then it could have been four all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They had a ten minute spell where you're thinking, ah, surely this isn't on. Um, Manchester United uh, obviously got Hoyland off the mark the other day Garnaccio with a double I think he's probably picked himself in the team now I mean he played on the right the other night didn't he so him and Rashford probably usurped Anthony he's probably going to be the, the sub uh, winger now um, Ten, Ten Hag likes him though doesn't he likes who? Anthony no naught assists yeah, and, not, and naught goals this season he does keep not a lot to like tells you he's <laughs> Ten, yeah. Ten Hag apparently uh, Ineos have said they want to work with him which is, is good news for him um, but he's got to start pulling results out of the fire I think they might do it actually I, I mean for me I think it'll probably be between Manchester United Tottenham and Aston Villa for that fourth mm. place I'm going to stick my neck out and say I think Aston Villa or Man United will get it Well you did tip United for the title so you've, I didn't you've tip got, for you've the got title I said they'd be in the title race which was a huge mistake but they should have been in the title race bearing in mind two things he said they've got to challenge for the title and he got everything he wanted in the summer in terms of recruitment. So really and truly, he should be. And he should be held to that account, I think. Yeah. Which is why, you know, when you look at the statistics, I'm surprised it doesn't come under even more scrutiny. The FA Cup's quite important for him as well. They've got the game at Wigan. I know you were commentating that they need, they need a run in that competition. He, he needs a trophy. OK, let's switch our focus now and on the battle of the bottom. Who's going to stay in the league. Have we got a real relegation scrap? Well, at the beginning of the season, the Premier League All Access podcast uh, recorded a preview from uh, Wembley in which I turned around to my esteemed colleague here and uh, Scott Minto and I said, everybody keeps saying Luton, Burnley and Sheffield United are going to go down. Is it as simple as that? And you said yes. It's not now though, is it? No, probably not, thanks to Luton. I still think the other two are looking pretty doomed, to be honest. I'm not expecting Sheffield United to do a great deal of business in January because we know the owner is trying to sell the club and I think actually Chris Wilder's return is probably more geared up to next season in the Championship than it is to this. I've not been at all impressed with Burnley. I think if you take James Trafford out of the equation, who's 
made a number of brilliant saves. They'd be even more adrift. And Terry talks about the spend of Premier League clubs. They spent as much as almost anybody in the summer and they've not got much to show for it. But Luton, we got to know Rob Edwards pretty well. I think he's a good coach. I think he's had a galvanising effect on that dressing room, certainly in the wake of the Tom Lockyer situation. I think they're a very hard-working group of players. We spoke to Elijah Adebayo on the White and Jordan show on Friday. He spoke very well and, and talked about the collective spirit and that willingness to prove people wrong. So I think if you're, if you're Everton, if you're Forest, if you're Palace, maybe even if you're Brentford at this moment mm. in time, Luton would worry you because I think they're capable of, put, of putting results together and they're always going to be difficult to play against, particularly with Kenilworth Road. After initial bounce, Everton have found themselves back down there, back scrapping it out because they've had that 10-point deduction. They'd have 26 points if yeah. it was the, 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 the other way We've around. We've been talking about the them with Europe. Yeah, they'll be in the top yeah. half of the table. But they've had a couple of setbacks and now all of a sudden they're getting close to that relegation zone. And I think psychologically, the closer you get to it, the more it starts to affect your performances. Yeah, and I think Sean Dyche spurs away City at home can look at those, those games and say... Well, they've been two tough games, mm. so we we're not losing against you know Brentford and Palace who are down there and Forest, tough games. I think they I think they'd be all right because I think they've got good enough players to to they've made up the deficit already. They've got the ten points back. They've earned them. I think they'll be okay. I hope Lewin stay up. I must be honest. I think I think Rob Edwards is refreshing to see. Perhaps it's the club I used to play for Wimbledon with that rotten old stadium where teams didn't like coming to play. They hated coming to play a plough lane. Mm. It was a real advantage to us then. And I look at Luton now and it's the same. I look at the, I think, that looks exactly the same as when I played there 25 years One ago. One side of the ground has completely changed. Yeah. But the rest of it is it's exactly the same exactly. as the 80s. And I can imagine like Man City the other week when they turned up there and the players getting off the bus. So I imagine the changing room. changing room. It's it, so it, small. It's yeah, so uh, yeah. crammed <laughs> down in that tunnel area. And it they need like to turn the hot water from off. The Victorian all those ages. And also the way they play, I think it's refreshing that we talk about ball. I think Sheffield United still, I think we'll get better. But I think there's too much of a gap to close. Mm. They're seven points but, away from the relegation. I, yeah, uh, from, I don't think they're safety. Got, I think Chris Wilder will get them better. We've seen that so far. They've been more competitive. So it was mm. a big loss against Lewin. Burnley, I've just they, they've come up with a... It looks to me as if Burnley are quite happy to be the team that goes up and down the divisions the next few years. They'll be able with Norwich and we've had with West Brom in the past. Because it doesn't appear to me they're making any effort to stand the division. Because they made no concessions to the fact that they played a style of football last year they got them promotion and they're going to stick to it this year. But the teams, they're playing better teams, better players, better coaches. And I just don't see any hope for them unless they did something different. Then you get Luton who come up in the playoffs. And I was hearing and I saw them towards the end of last season because I was watching Coventry's progress. Mm. And I thought, well, these are big and strong and <laughs> they don't mess about with a ball at the back. Yeah. And you have to do something different. If Luton came up and tried to change their game and play like Men City and play like the other teams oh, in the league. picked off. Exactly. So I'm quite enjoying the, the, the challenge. Mentally, they've got over that, we're not worthy of being in this division. Yeah. They've got across that now, which took them a while. Now it's, they're saying, you don't like the way we play. You don't like coming to Kenilworth Road. And we're going to embrace that and, and make the most of it. But interestingly, when we spoke to Elijah Adebayo uh, this morning, he was saying that we did have a period of adaptation that we sort of had to learn what it was like playing Premier League football because it is a bit faster, it is a bit more uh, you know, slick, the tempo's higher. Mistakes get punished. Mistakes get punished every time you make it. You can't have four chances to score a goal. You've got to take them. And, and they've started to realise that now. There's a higher higher threshold and it's a, it's a higher level. And they've now got to grips with that and they feel they can kick on. It was the first couple of games, wasn't it? They were very naive on the opening day against Brighton, conceded far too many chances in that game. They were really poor, actually, when they went to Stamford Bridge quite early in the season as well, made it easy for Chelsea. But since then, they've become resolute. They've taken a point at home to Liverpool. They've led against Man City. They were very unlucky not to beat Arsenal, let alone not to come away with a point in the end from that game. So, yeah, I think you have to be impressed with the way that they're learning on the job. And it's, it's a problem, as I say, for those teams above them. The, the team I probably fear for most at this moment in time of those above the dotted line are Brentford. They've had so many injuries. Obviously, they've got Ivan Tony to come back, which is going to be a massive boost. But how fit is he mentally and he physically for? as well? Will he still be a Brentford player come the end of the window? If they were to sell him in January, I would be seriously concerned. They've got 19 points. And at this stage of the season, 19 points is quite a lot to be thinking about the possibility of relegation when you've still got 
another 19 games. It's point to play. of game, isn't it? Well, just they've got more. They've got more than that, by the way, because they've they've only played 18. Yeah, it's just over a point of game. So you're looking at 40 again, 40 points. Mm. But the teams at the bottom, are we expecting the bottom three this year to reach 40 points? No, no we're near. No, we near it. So, but I I agree with Alex Brentford Palace not a good run of form as well. Well, Crystal Palace are, are, are worth talking about well. because we've discussed this quite a lot. I can't believe that Crystal Palace don't have some sort of plan, some cunning plan in the background. Because why would you employ Roy Hodgson for just one year if you didn't have something in your mind about what you're going to do in the future? They must be either waiting for a manager to become available. That may well have been Steve Cooper. Um, it might be Gareth Southgate at the end of the Euros, I don't know. But they didn't spend any money either during the August transfer window, the July and August transfer window. So they must be waiting to give that money to somebody else. Either that or it is, as we've mentioned before, the structure behind the scenes that they're investing in. W what do you think will happen there? Because Roy Hodgson's gone on an eight-game winless run now, but going into the weekend's game against Brentford, which is a big one. I think they'll find a way for Roy to leave amicably because, you know, I think you have to acknowledge what he has done at Crystal Palace. He did come in and save them last season when they looked like they were sinking under Patrick Vieira. I think the fans still appreciate that, but I think they know that it's probably time for a change. And I think that change will be Steve Cooper, assuming he wants to go straight back in this early. That yeah. change should have been made last summer, though, in my opinion. I think if it was only going to be for a year, Roy Hodgson, then the plan should have been initiated. Last summer. So they didn't Just, want to pay compensation, maybe, for Steve Or perhaps Cooper. it was a hard decision because it, it achieved keeping them up. Well, he, he had to... So his contract was, had run out and he went away. Took and a then while. And they, then they mm. rang him up and said, can you come back and do another year? So it, it was, must have, there must be something going on because why would you leave it, think you might be doing something else, and then go back and say, no... Can you come back for one more well, year? Because I think the noises they were getting out of Forest, even at that stage, despite the fact that Cooper did a good job in the end and kept them up, was that there was a, a relationship breakdown between manager and owner and that maybe Cooper may be available. And I, I, that's why all, route, all it, roads lead to that for me. Is it definitely Steve Cooper, do you think? I think if he wants it, it'll be Steve Cooper. They've chased him for two years. Yeah, well, I, mean, I, I remember talking to you and telling you that I thought he was going to get the job yeah. before Patrick Vieira uh, because they'd, they'd been sounding him out when he was at Swansea. Yeah, I just think last year was it, it was we can't sack Roy now, we can't ask him to leave now because he, he came in and kept us up. So that was the, the perfect way though know. for him to go. I it was like almost you. like a sort of yeah. like, well done, Roy. It's been great. We've had a great relationship. Look at what you've done. And from what they went, they looked like they had the plan with Pedro Vieira, didn't they? A younger yeah. manager that was. They've tried that up. a couple of times now, and they yeah. did with De Boer as well. Yeah. So it's important for Steve Parrish that he gets this call right. But does he need to also understand that you are, if you're Crystal Palace, going to go on eight game winless runs at times because this is the Premier League and it, it, you know, sometimes it does bite you for a couple of weeks and months because of, of the sheer level that you're playing at. But well, they panicked last year, didn't they, with Patrick? He was 12 yeah. games, I think he went yeah. winless and then they decided to, 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 to sack him. Just before a winnable run of, uh, Just, run of yeah, fixtures. That was, exactly, yeah, that, that was, was the strange yeah, thing. I never understood it. The run they went on, every game was a tough one. Then you saw the next fixtures and you thought, if they, you know, if they so do, do you think they require a little bit more patience in that regard? Because you oh, know, the fans do. will tell you, no, they were going nowhere under Patrick. Yeah, I think all, all clubs do, to be honest. I think there's, there's always an element of where the blame lies. Eventually, we'll blame, we'll lie with the chairman or the owners. And before it gets to them, they make sure that someone else has been mm. cut. So um, that's the normal procedure, isn't it? So I think clubs could be patient. Well, they've got rid of uh, Steve Cooper at uh, Nottingham Forest. They've replaced him with Nuno Espirito Santo. Um, obviously, he's won away at Newcastle. Big game on Saturday night against Manchester United. Um, is, he, is it a surprise choice that Nuno Espirito Santo has gone in there? Not overly, because you've got the, uh, you've got the George Mendes connection. I'd imagine there'll be some Mendes players arriving in January. And I said to you, you're a big fan of Steve Cooper. I think Nuno is a better fit for what Forrest want to do than Steve Cooper. Steve Cooper, to me, is a project manager. You don't get the chance to build a project. How is he a Nottingham better Forest. fit? He took over of them when they were bottom you know, of the he's table. Done he's taken them into the Premier League for the first time in 23 years. He's kept them in the division. That's not a How is anybody a better fit? That's not a disparaging statement for Steve Cooper, but he wants a project. He wants to do his work on the training pitch. He wants the chance to develop a team. You can't do that at Forrest when they're thrusting 14 players on you. So every you're, what you're window. saying is, is that he's achieved the role that he's supposed to achieve and now... The next stage of the project goes to somebody else. 
Yeah, potentially. If there is, the project is just staying in the division. Surely. I think he's, more, I project, think he's more ambitious than that, Mastronakis. Well, Maranakis. Well, uh, Maranakis needs to have his head read if he thinks he's going to be more ambitious than staying in the Premier League. As he looks at the history of the division, how many teams managed to achieve anything more than just staying in it for a couple of years before you then slowly but surely build? He was talking about European spots and everything, wasn't he? And he was talking about that the, after they won the playoff final at Wembley yeah. to Jim White. He said, you know, we're not here just to make up the numbers. I said to you that actually in that preview, I think I said that Nottingham Forest would be in danger of getting relegated you if did. we didn't give Steve Cooper what he wanted. And actually now they've got rid of Steve Cooper, I think they'll be coming into sharp I agree with Alex about the, 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 num the number of players that come into Forest. It's too many. And out of Forest, it's too many. And Nuno is used to that, to be honest. I mean, he, he's getting jobs back on the back of, I'm not interested who you buy. You know, I, I'm not going to have an opinion. Just keep, keep that door rolling around. And I'll pick the best 11 week, every week and take it in that, that way. It's, I mean, you, you, Nuno is the first client ever, isn't, isn't he, of George Mendes? He is, yeah. So he's... Always going to get a job? Probably, and he's always got jobs. He's not an inspiring choice. No, but not an inspiring so the guy. Win, the win last week was in, in, in Paul. And listen, it? this yeah, is very polite it's... half of the time, Nuno, but he can also be one of those who's very animated and very stressed. And he hates doing, dealing with the media, hates talking uh, you know, in interviews and stuff like that. He's gone on a charm offensive, though, at Forrest, because he knows that the fans didn't want Steve Cooper to go. So actually, by all accounts, at his first press conference, he was shaking the hands of journalists, saying how nice it is to see you again. Yeah. Whereas we, normally, he wouldn't give us the time should of day. We, should, we, should we put a clock on that? <laughs> yeah, see how long that lasts for. Um, I've been, I was actually, I remember where it was. I was at Brighton, and he was at Wolverhampton Wanderers manager at the time. And I was in the tunnel, and he came storming in, like thrashing doors, did an interview, walked out, and the, the press guy that was trying desperately to get him to do the rest of his commitments, and he just went, no, and walked off, and he didn't do any of, uh, any of the stuff that he was supposed to do as a result I mean, Wolves, it was a similar role at Wolves, wasn't it? Lots of players coming in, yeah. lots of players going yeah, yeah. out. And he did well at Wolves to get the promoters. That, yeah, they so had he, enough of him by the end, though, players and the hierarchy. Yeah, which is why they let him go when his contract ran out. Oh, actually, that was the story, but he got sacked, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah, he got sacked. The story was is that he had an extra year and then everyone thought his contract had run out and it, they tried to make it sort of look seamless, but actually he did get fired from that job. Uh, we haven't talked much about Newcastle United. We would have done that in the previous um, uh, section about the European places, but they do need some recruitment, although I'm told there's not that much money available. In fact, Eddie Howe, even talking today, is talking about a lack of funds being available in January. But not even sure they can afford the loan fee for Calvin Phillips at this moment in time. Tough, but you know what they like? They like to play it down. They love to play it down because they don't want everyone to know how much money they've really got. Yeah, why is there a lack of funds? Why is there because of FFP? FFP. Because they don't yeah. generate enough really to, to be able to spend the level the, the wealth that they've got available to them. Um, let's uh, round things off by having a look at some of the standout performers of the season so far. Um, what was the best goal of the season so far? Alejandro Ganacho. For Manchester United yeah, against Everton. Yeah, the, the spectacular overhead kick that comes off. How many did we see that don't? You see some where you think, oh, it's come off his shit anyway, but that one was a pure strike. I think that's the easy one to say, and I think that's fine. One. There's yeah. a team goal that Brighton scored, I think against Nottingham Forest, Evan Ferguson, when he caressed the ball yeah. from the edge of the penalty area into there. the bottom corner. But it's a, it's a goal that starts deep inside Brighton territory. And, and the way they sort of slalom the way through... Nottingham Forest and then eventually score the goal. I think that's a terrific goal uh, that's been scored. We've seen some brilliant screamers as well, haven't you? Actually, Hoyland's goal against Aston Villa, the way he reacts and turns and puts it into the net, is quite a, a good goal as it's well. Stupid, man. The other it's night as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another, come back. another absolute cracker. I'm racking my brain to see if there's any Chelsea goals that I can think of that were good goals. But Nicholas Jackson must I have scored a few. I can't, remember, I can't remember that many. He scored more than Rasmus Hoyland. <laughs> how many has Hoyland got in the Premier League? I can't, I can't remember. How many is it? It's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. <laughs> I love the fact that he cast dispersions at everybody else and then when he looks at his own team, he's like, oh, no, no, he's all right, I like him. I know his agent. Um, <laughs> Declan Rice had a good start to the season. Yeah, I, yeah, I think he has. Yeah, I think that he's fitted in like he's been there for years, to be honest. It's a move that's worked out quite well for everyone because Will Prowse has done well at West Ham for the money they got for him. The other, other boy, statement. The other boy, Alvarez, has done fantastic. Yeah, it's worked out well, well for West Ham. It's working out well for Declan. He looks... He's settled in. It's slightly easier when you move across the city as mm. well. You know, when you move different parts of the country, or you move from one country to the other. So he's Declan Rice has settled in as exactly as I thought he would. He's a he's a very good footballer. 
Um, Position Arsenal needed fulfilling and he's, he's settled in really well. Manager of the first half of the season so far, David Moyes? I think David Moyes probably would be manager of the calendar year when you take into account their European Unai trophy Emery? as well. Hey, I think, yeah. I think it's Unai Emery. Yeah. They've exceeded... I didn't expect them to be on the run and be in the position they are. And it's still a team that's being built, new director of football, once mm. he was gone in there. They're still moving players out and bringing people in. But the signs are really good. And Unai Emery... Uh, it's interesting. I mean, spoke to players that played under him in Spain... He drives you mad after a few seasons, so make the most of him while you can, Aston Villa, or move the players on. Because <laughs> uh, he's so demanding every, every single day, every single training session. But all the managers are now, though, aren't they? If you look at all of them... Uh, they, if you know, they've all got that level, but then he's another notch up. Pep's so he? demanding. The Klopp's, dema Klopp's not as demanding. Arteta certainly is demanding. Unai Emery is demanding. Or, funnily enough, all these managers are at the top of the table, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Eddie Howe's incredibly demanding. Deserby. Deserby is so demanding. Ten Hag is demanding. I mean, that's just the way... It, uh, David Moyes is, is, is demanding. Not only of his players, but his staff as well. Yeah, he's I mean, a they do a huge amount of hours there in preparations uh, for games and getting their, their, their team uh, ready. Um, what about Bournemouth? Because I think there was a point early in the season when everyone was sitting there going, who on earth have they bought in this fella? Why on earth is this guy turned up down here? Why have they got rid of Gary O'Neill? They're going to get relegated. There's no chance. All of a sudden, they're the form team in the Premier League. They're up to 12, 25 points from 18 games. They won't get relegated now. It was the Wolves game was the turning point. That was the moment I thought, I wonder if they're going to make the change. Mm. Panic. Because it was Wolves, because it was Gary O'Neill, they lost at home. Wolves went up, were above them, miles above them. It was a home defeat against Wolves. The criticisms you just said were, were valid at that time. You're thinking, well, why did you let Gary O'Neill? Why did you bring Irola in? I wonder how close it was, because since then... Well, we spoke to them straight after that, thinking, because there were a lot of rumours that he was going to be sat that Monday. And we were sitting, I remember you and I were sitting there, and we were speaking to the people at Bournemouth, and they were saying, no, no truth in it. Don't go near it. It's not going to happen. They stuck with him that day. And since then, it has gone north. And actually, I've spoken to Bill Foley since then, the owner, and said, look, was there ever any thought in your mind that you made a mistake? And he said, absolutely not. We could see the progress that was being made. And again, it's, uh, it's an example of where patience paid off. Yeah. Actually, it's quite short-term patience, really, when you think how quickly they've turned it around. The mark of a coach, for me, in the modern game, is, is the ability to improve players. Ask Dominic Solanke if Iriola mm. has improved his output. Ask Ryan Christie if he's getting an extra 10% out of him in midfield. Ask Lewis Cook, who's back to playing as well as he did when he was called up by England. So I think he's doing a terrific job. And you know what? They're great to watch. This is a Bournemouth side more in the mould of Eddie Howe. And I think one of the criticisms that the fans would level at Gary O'Neill is that the football was a little bit turgid at times. They were always playing on the back foot, trying to hit on the counter. They're much more positive now under Iriola. It was really interesting because you and I had a lot of conversations about this when Iriola first was appointed yeah. as the manager and we talked about how he was going to play. And I came on this podcast after talking to you, talking to a few of the other of our colleagues that work with us on La Liga, and we were, we were saying, you know, this guy will eventually get it right. It might take a little while because his methods are quite extreme. And if you listen to Dominic Solanke recently, he's been telling us, you know, it took him ages just to understand what Iriola was asking of him because he wasn't used to the pressing angles that he wanted him to, to take, where his body should be. He was playing along some somebody else who was also coming to press and they were getting into each other's way early on in the season because he just wasn't used to that sort of level of tactical information and what was being asked of him. But now, because he's drilled it into them every single day, it's almost automatic in their brains. They know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And that's the fruit of labour, isn't it? You, you work hard, you, do, you put the work in week to week and all of a sudden you start to see it bear fruit. And they bought quite a few new players as well. Yeah. And then, so that needs bedding in. Then they're not winning games, they're conceding goals, they're making terrible mistakes at the back in terms of their attempts to play out of the back. That was costing them goals every single game. And I remember saying to you, that, that wasn't his style no. in La Liga. That's the other thing. There, weren't, the, there, was, there was none of that high press. Right, Icona, where he played, never were obsessed with playing out the back. They played out the back when it was on. If it wasn't on, they went long. Mm. And, and we saw with Bournemouth, there was this like, obsession with playing out the back under all costs. And it was costing them. So what you're seeing now is that that's the big change. Now you see them, they're playing, they're doing the fundamentals. That's why I thought he was good at Rai Vaikana. His fundamentals were good. Play out the back when it's on. If it's not, go long. 
make sure you block shots, make sure, sure you block crosses, make sure you're tracking runs in midfield. All those old-fashioned fundamentals. And then he has a style of play when they're in possession where they play the ball forward quickly. So instead of lots of square passes and then the opponents get back in position, it was can you run with the ball forward, can you pass the ball forward as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. Training session set up where you've got 15 seconds for having a 10 on goal from the halfway line. You know, that, that's, that was his style at Rai Vaikana, but we didn't see that early on. So it was just a me- mixture of him. He's only brought one coach with him. So the rest of the coaches are still at the club. And him and his coach, Nigo Perry, is trying to get used to a new group of players for him and the coach and a new group of players that had just been bought as well. Mm. So, but the patience, patience was, was key. But it's, it's easy to say now for Bill Foley to say, no, we, we had faith. It, result, it, bottom line are results. Yeah, if they'd lost another Still, five games in a row after that, yeah. there would have been a complete change yeah, of, yeah. of mind. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but they, listen, they're up into 12th position going into the weekend. Uh, big matches to come over the weekend, including Luton versus Chelsea, Manchester City, Sheffield United, uh, both live on TalkSport on Saturday. And then on uh, Monday night, uh, the 1st of January, we've got the big one, Liverpool against Newcastle United. Very much looking forward to that. What a game is in store there, Terry. That's I mean, Pressure's on both teams. Uh, yeah, Liverpool. Got Liverpool you know, can go top and uh, yeah. put a bit of a cushion. Different pressure. And Newcastle needs to... You know, Eddie Howe's got the problems some other managers have got where he's haven't played the same group of players every single game. A little bit of a rest for them, not playing in, until Monday, but they picked up other injuries the other day, didn't they? And the, yeah. In the game in London Forest, there was more injuries picked up there, so the last fixture Newcastle would want to know would be Liverpool away on the back of the injuries and, and the form that they're in at the moment, so should be a good opportunity for Liverpool. Yep. Um, what do you think about the game? It's a classic Premier League fixture, 4-3. Uh, is always the scoreline that is attached to it because of the old Collymore closing in. But we could see a goal fest, couldn't we? Yeah, we had a good game at St James's Park early in the season, didn't we? When uh, Newcastle took the lead, Liverpool had a player sent off and still managed to win the game. Yeah, they did. It was a great game. That and actually, that's been a bit of a pattern for Newcastle. They, they've taken the lead in a lot of matches and, and not managed to hold out. AC Milan, of course, uh, most damagingly in the Champions League. Uh, do I expect a goal fest? I expect a Liverpool goal fest. I think this will actually be quite a comfortable home win. Do you? Yeah. Uh, you remember that game. That was a 4.30 on a Sunday afternoon, that Liverpool uh, trip to St James's Park. You do all the big games on a Sunday afternoon, don't you? Yeah, I think I was off that day. Oh, yeah. It was because it was too far north for you. <laughs> too much travelling involved. Didn't fancy it. Oh, there's a shock. Uh, right, OK, that's it from us. So thank you very much for tuning into the Premier League All Access podcast. As I mentioned, loads of live games on uh, uh, the way over the course of the weekend. The Premier League All Access podcast will be back uh, next week as well. We go back to two a week uh, once January kicks in. There'll be a lot to talk about in terms of transfers, won't there? Because there'll be so many clubs with lots of money to spend and Crookie will be all over it without a doubt. So make sure you stick listening to TalkSport and the Premier League All Access podcast. 